The following is a production of God Sounds Incorporated. For more information on our voiceover services and to see our online store, please go to godsounds.com. God Sounds, where faith is heard. Chapter 1 Verse 1 Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This kiss, which the soul desires of its God, is essential union or a real, permanent, and lasting possession of its divine object. It is the spiritual marriage. That this may be understood, it is necessary to explain the difference between a union of the powers and essential union. Either of them may be transitory and for a few moments only, or permanent and lasting. The union of the powers is that by which God unites the soul to Himself, but very superficially. It is more properly a contact than a union. It is nevertheless united to the personal trinity according to the different effects peculiar to each member of it, but always as if to distinct persons and by an intermediate operation. This operation serves both as a means and an end, the soul resting in the union thus experienced, without supposing that there is anything beyond. This union is accomplished in order in all the powers of the soul, and is sometimes perceived in one or two of them according to the designs of God, and at others in all three together. This constitutes the application of the soul to the Holy Trinity as two distinct persons. When the union is in the understanding alone, it is a union of pure intellect and is attributed to the Word as a distinct person. When the union is in the memory, which is affected by an absorption of the soul into God and a profound forgetfulness of the creature, it is attributed to the Father as a distinct person. And when it takes place in the will alone, by a loving joy without sight or knowledge of anything distinct, it is a union of love and is attributed to the Holy Spirit as a distinct person. And this latter is the most perfect of all, because it approaches nearer than any other to essential union, and is generally the road by which the soul arrives at it. All these unions are divine embraces, but they are not the kiss of his mouth. These unions are of two sorts, the one transistory and very short-lived, the other permanent and sustained by the perpetual presence of God and a sweet and tranquil love which continues in the midst of everything. Such, in a few words, is the union of the powers, which is a union of betrothal. It implies the affection of the heart, caresses and mutual presence, as is the case with the betrothed, but not the full enjoyment of its object. Essential union and the kiss of his mouth is the spiritual marriage, where there is a union of essence with essence and a communication of substance, where God takes the soul for a spouse and unites himself to it, no longer by persons nor by any act or means, but immediately reducing all into unity and possessing it in his own unity. Then, it is the kiss of His mouth in real and perfect possession. It is an enjoyment which neither barren nor unfruitful, since it extends to nothing less than the communication of the Word of God to the soul. We must remember that God is all mouth, as He is all Word, and that the application of this divine mouth to the soul is the perfect enjoyment and consummation of the marriage by which the communication of God Himself and of His Word is made to the soul.
This is what may be called the apostolic state, in which the soul is not only espoused, but fruitful. For God, as mouth, is sometime united to the soul before rendering it fruitful of his own fecundity. There are some who maintain that this union cannot take place until the next life, but I am confident that it may be attained in this, with this reservation, that here we possess without seeing, there we shall behold what we possess. Now I say, that while the view of God is in addition to our glory, without which it would be incomplete, it does not, nevertheless, constitute essential beatitude. For we are happy from the moment we receive the supreme good and can receive and enjoy it without seeing it. We enjoy it here in the night of faith, where we have the pleasure of enjoyment without the satisfaction of sight. There, we shall have the clear vision of God in addition to the happiness of possessing Him. But this blindness hinders neither the true possession nor the veritable enjoyment of the object nor the consummation of the divine marriage any more than it does the real communication of the word to the soul. This is far from imaginary, as will be attested by every person of experience. The present is a proper opportunity to resolve the difficulty of some spiritual persons who think that when the soul is united with God in an essential union, it can no longer speak of Jesus Christ and His interior states, the soul having passed through and left that state. I agree with them entirely that union to Jesus Christ has preceded for a long time the essential union, since union with Him as a person took place during the union of the powers, and further, that the union with the God-man, Christ Jesus, is the first of all and occurs at the very beginning of the illuminated life. But as regards the communication of the word to the soul, I say that the soul must first have arrived in God alone and been there established in essential union and by the spiritual marriage before the divine communication can be made to it, as the fruits and products of marriage can only appear after its consummation. All this is more real than can be expressed, and in the fact that God here possesses the soul without interruption, we may trace the difference between essential union and every other kind. When united with the creature, we can only enjoy it by intervals, because the creature is without, but the enjoyment of God is permanent and lasting, because it is within, and God being our final end. The soul can incessantly pour itself into him as into its goal and center, to be there mingled and transformed without ever again coming out. Just as a river, which is composed of water derived from the sea, and quite distinct from it, finding itself away from its original, endeavors in various ways to reach the ocean, which, having done, it loses and mixes itself with it just as it was before it left there and can no longer be distinguished from it. It is further to be observed that God, in creating us, made us participants of His being and fit to be reunited to Him, at the same time bestowing upon us a tendency towards such a reunion. He has imparted a similar trait to the human body in respect to man in a state of innocence drawing it from man himself, that he might give it this inclination to union, as to its origin. But as this takes place between gross, material substances, the union can only be material and very restricted, because it occurs between solid and impenetrable bodies. This may be illustrated by the attempt to unite two metals of very different qualities by fusing them together they never can be perfectly united on account of their dissimilitude, but the nearer alike the two metals are, the more readily they mix. On the other hand, mix two glasses of water, and the two immediately become so mingled as to be undistinguishable. Thus, the soul, 
being perfectly spiritual in its character, is altogether fitted to be united, mingled, and transformed in its God. This may be illustrated by the union of salt and water. When a lump of rock salt is thrown into water, there is union between the two, because they are on all sides united. But when the salt is liquefied, dissolved, and vanished, then there is union and admixture. There may be a union without any intermixture, such as the union of the powers. But the intermingling is the essential union, and this union is absolute, being of all in the all. It is only to God that the soul can be thus united, because such is its nature by creation. This is what St. Paul calls being changed into the same image and the Savior. Oneness. Now this takes place when the soul loses its proper subsistence to exist only in God, by which is meant mystically the loss of all self-appropriation and a loving and perfect sinking of the soul into Him, and not that essential despoiling of its intimate existence implied in the hypostatic union it is as when a drop of water is let fall into a cup of wine, it loses its own appropriate form and character, and is apparently changed into wine, but its being and substance always remains entirely distinct, so that, if it were the will of God, an angel could, at any time, separate the identical drop. In the same way, the soul may always be separated from God, though with great difficulty, this, then, is the lofty and intimate union that the spouse so pressingly demands at the hand of the bridegroom. She asks it of him as though she was addressing another as impetuous sally of love, giving vent to her passion without particular thought as to whom she was speaking. Let him kiss me, says she, since he can do it, but let it be with the kisses of his mouth. No other union can content me, that alone can satisfy all my desires, and that is what I demand. Verse 1 continued to verse 2. For thy breasts are better than wine, and more fragrant than the choicest ointments. Thy breasts, O God, from which thou nourishest souls in their beginnings, are so sweet and pleasant that they render thy children, and even those who have yet need of the breast, stronger than the stoutest men who are drinkers of wine. They are so fragrant that, by their charming perfume, they attract those souls that are happy enough to perceive it. They are also like a precious ointment that heals every interior wound. Ah, if this be so, even at the outset, what delights will there not be in the nuptial kiss, the kiss of his mouth? This song of songs starts in the beginning with an announcement of what is to be its end and, as it were, the recompense and perfection of the spouse. For it is altogether natural that the prospect and desire of the end should precede the choice of the means. These latter are then described in order, beginning with spiritual infancy. It was a view of this end that induced the spouse to ask, in the first instance, the kiss of his mouth, though it is the last thing she will receive, and that only after having undergone many a trial and many a toil. Verse 2 continued. Thy name is as oil poured forth. Therefore, have the virgins loved thee. Sensible grace, which is here signified by the name of the bridegroom, penetrates the whole soul so powerfully with the sweetness which God sends to the souls he intends to fill with his love, that it is truly like a balm poured forth, which extends and insensibly increases in proportion as it is more and more poured out and with so excellent an odor that the young soul finds itself wholly penetrated 
by its power and sweetness. This takes place without violence and with so much pleasure that the soul, still young and feeble, suffers itself to be carried away by these innocent charms. This is the way God causes Himself to be loved by young hearts, who are not as yet capable of loving except on account of the pleasure they experience in loving. It was by a stream of this oil of gladness that the Father anointed the Son above His fellows, who shall share His glory with Him. Verse 3 Draw me, we will run after thee to the odor of thine ointments. This young lover prays the bridegroom to draw her by the center of her soul, as if she were not satisfied with the sweetness of the balsam poured forth among her powers, for she already comprehends, through the grace of the bridegroom, who continually draws her with more and more force, that there is an enjoyment of himself more noble and more intimate than that which she at present shares. This is what gives rise to her present request. Draw me, says she, into the most interior chambers of my soul, that my powers and senses may all run to thee by this deeper, though less perceptible, course. Draw me, O divine lover, and we will run after thee by recollection which causes us to perceive the divine force by which thou drawst us towards thee. In running, we will be guided by a certain odor, perceived by virtue of thine attraction, which is the smell of the ointment, Thou hast already poured forth to heal the evil that sin has caused in our powers and to purify our senses from the corruption that is there entered. We will even outrun this odor to reach thee, the center of our bliss. This excellent perfume gives rise to the prayer of recollection because the senses as well as the powers all run after its odor, which causes them to taste with delight that the Lord is good. Verse 3 Continued The King hath brought me into his store chambers. We will exult and be glad in thee, remembering thy breasts better than wine. The upright love thee. The soul has no sooner manifested her desire to pass by all creatures that it may run to him. Then, to recompense her for a love already somewhat purified. He causes her to enter into his divine store chambers. This is a greater grace than any she has hitherto received, for it is a transient union in the powers. When the heart of a man displays sufficient fidelity to be willing to dispense with all the gifts of God that it may reach God himself, he takes pleasure in showering upon it a profusion of the very gifts it did not seek, but he removes them with indignation from those who prefer them to seeking himself alone. It was a knowledge of this that caused the royal prophet to urge all men to seek the Lord and his strength, to seek his face evermore, as though he would have said, do not stop at the graces or gifts of God, which are only as the rays that issue from His face, but which are not Himself. Mount up to His very throne, and there seek Him. Seek His face evermore, until you are so blessed as to find it. Then, says the spouse, transported with joy at the ineffable secret revealed to her, then, when we are in Thee, O God, we shall exult and be glad in Thee. We will remember Thy breasts more than wine, that is, the remembrance of having preferred the bridegroom over everything else, will be the height of her joy and pleasure. She had already chosen the sweetness of His milk before the wine of the pleasures of this world. Wherefore, she says, we will remember thy breasts more than wine. Here she chooses God in preference to his spiritual consolations, in the transports of grace, 
which she experienced while drawing the milk of his breasts. She adds, The upright love thee, to signify that the true uprightness which leads the soul to dispense with all the pleasures of earth and the enjoyments of heaven, to be lost in God, is what constitutes pure and perfect love. In truth, O my God, none but those who are upright in the way can love thee as thou deservest to be loved. Verse 4 I am black, but calmly, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. As the greatest graces of God tend always to produce in us a deeper knowledge of what we are, and as they would not come from Him if they did not give, in their degree, a certain taste of the misery of the creature, so it is with this soul. Scarcely has she emerged from the store chambers of the king before she discovers that she is black. What is this thy blackness, O thou incomparable maiden? We say to her, Tell us, we pray thee. I am black, she says, because I perceive by the lights of my divine Son hosts of defects, of which I was never aware until now. I am black because I am not yet cleansed of self. But, nevertheless, I am calmly as the tents of Kedar. This experimental knowledge of what I am is extremely pleasing to my bridegroom and induces him to visit me as a place of rest. I am calmly because, having no voluntary stain, my spouse renders me fair with his own beauty. The blacker I am in my own eyes, the fairer I am in his. I am calmly, too, as the curtains of Solomon. The curtains of the divine Solomon are the holy humanity which conceals the word of God made flesh. I am calmly, she says, as his curtains, for he has made me a partaker of his beauty in this, that as the holy humanity concealed the divinity, so my apparent blackness hides the greatness of God's workings in my soul. I am black also from the crosses and persecutions which attack me from without, but I am calmly as the curtains of Solomon, because blackness and the cross make me like him. I am black because outward weaknesses appear in me, but I am calmly, because my intention is pure within. Verse 5 Look not upon me, because I am dark-colored, because the sun hath tanned me. My mother's children strove against me. They made me keeper in the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Why is it? that the betrothed asks that they will not look upon her in her blackness. Because the soul, entering now into the state of faith and spoliation of sensible grace, loses by degree the sweet vigor that led her so easily to the practice of virtue and made her externally so beautiful. And not being able any longer to perform her previous acts, because God requires something else of her, she seems to have fallen back into a state of nature. This seems so to those who are not enlightened. And it is for this reason that she exclaims, I beseech you, my friends and companions, who have not yet arrived at so interior a point, you, who are yet in the first experiences of the spiritual life, judge me not, because I am dark-colored externally nor because of my outward defects, real or apparent. For they do not happen from want of love and courage, as is the case with souls in the beginning, but because my divine Son has looked upon me with His constant, burning beams and changed my color. He has taken away my natural complexion that I might have only such a one as His fiery fervor would give me. It is the violence of love 
that dries up and tans my skin, and not its departure. This blackness is an advance, not a relapse, but a progress not for your imitation at your tender age, for the blackness which you would give yourselves would be a defect. To be right, it must only proceed from the Son of Righteousness, who, for His own glory and the highest good of the soul, burns up and destroys that dazzling outward complexion which was a source of blindness to the soul, though a cause of great admiration to those about, to the great prejudice of the bridegroom's glory. My mother's children, beholding me thus black, sought to compel me to resume my active life and direct my attention to the exterior. Instead of devoting myself to the destruction of my interior passions, they strove against me for a long while, and in the end, not being able to resist them, I yielded to their desires. But in attending to these outward and foreign things, I have not kept mine own vineyard, which is my interior, where my God dwells. That is my whole care, and the only vineyard I ought to keep. And since I have not kept my own, since I have been inattentive to the voice of my God, I have been still less faithful in guarding those of others. This is the persecution that souls are ordinarily subjected to, when it is once perceived that their constant introversion causes neglect of some external thing, the soul being entirely turned inward, and hence not being able to apply herself to the correction of certain trifling defects that the bridegroom will himself remedy in due time. Verse 6 Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou reposest at midday, lest I should begin to wander after the flocks of thy companions. O thou whom my soul loveth, exclaims this poor affianced one, thus obliged to leave this sweet employment within, to be engaged about external matters of the lowest description. O thou, whom I love so much, the more as I find my love more thwarted. Ah, show me where thou feedest thy flocks, and with what food thou satisfiest thy souls that are so blessed as to be under thy care. We know that when thou wert upon earth, thy meat and drink was to do the will of thy Father, and now thy meat is that thy friends do thy will. Thou still feedest thy followers upon thyself, revealing to them thine infinite perfection, to the end that they may love thee more fervently. And the more thou art revealed, the more they seek to know, that they may be able ever to love thee more and more. Tell me also, pursues she, where thou reposest at noon. By this figure, she intends to convey the vehemence of pure love desiring to learn from its author and master in what it consists. Lest perchance, wandering into some human path, though under the semblance of spirituality, she may be misled and may be ministering to self-love at the very moment when she was persuaded she had nothing in view but pure love and the glory of God alone. She is right in fearing a mistake which involves such important consequences and which is too common among the flocks of the church. It happens whenever persons are guided by spiritual advisors whom Jesus Christ has truly rendered his companions, associating them with himself in the direction of souls, but who, not being dead to themselves nor crucified to the world with him, do not teach their pupils to deny themselves to be crucified and dead in everything, in order to live to God only, and that Christ may live in them. Whence it happens that both being in an extremely natural and unmortified life, their path is also exceedingly human, and consequently liable to turn aside hither and thither, frequently changing their devotions and their guides, without ever arriving at anything solid, and because this wandering arises from the failure to consult with care the maxims and example of Jesus Christ, 
and to apply to Him by prayer, to obtain from Him what He alone can grant us. Therefore, it is that this beloved soul, being well instructed, implores with so much earnestness the knowledge of His Word with which He feeds souls, and faithfulness to follow His example. For she knows that these alone, with the help of grace, can prevent her from going astray. We are too often arrested at created means, however religious. God alone can teach us to do His will, for He alone is our God. She asks also of the Word that He would conduct her to His Father, since He is the way that leads there. The bosom of the Father being the place where He rests in the noontide of His glory and in the full light of eternity. She desires to be lost in God with Jesus, His Son, to be there hidden and there to rest forever. And though she does not say so explicitly, she gives us to understand it distinctly enough by what she says afterwards, lest I should begin to wander as I have done. There I shall be perfectly secure. I shall never more be deceived. And what is far better, I shall sin no more. Verse 7 If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. The bridegroom replies to his bride, and to prepare her for the grace which he would bestow, as well as to instruct her in the use of what she has already received. He gives her a most important direction. If thou know not, says he, go forth. He means to say that she cannot know the divine object of her love, however passionately she may desire it, except she first know herself. For the nothingness of the creature helps our conception of the all of God. But as the light necessary for discovering the creature's abyss of nothingness exists only in the all of God, he directs her to go forth. Whence? From herself. How? By abandonment and fidelity in applying it to everything, permitting herself no natural satisfaction and no life in self or any creature. And whither? To enter into God by an absolute self-abandonment, where she will find that He is all and in all, and that she herself, consequently, and every creature are merely nothingness. Now, nothingness deserves no esteem, because it has no good, neither does it merit love, for it is nothing. It is only worthy, on the contrary, of contempt and hatred on account of the self-esteem and self-love entirely opposed to God, that have been implanted in it by sin. If the creature, then, aspire to divine union, it must be well persuaded of the all of God and its own nothingness, and must go forth of itself, feeling nothing but contempt and hatred for itself, that it may reserve all its esteem and love for God, and by this means it may attain to union this going forth from self by perpetual abandonment of every selfish interest is the interior work which the heavenly bridegroom prescribes to those who are sighing after the kiss of his mouth. He thus signifies it to the soul by the single expression, Go forth, which is sufficient to guide her inward course. As regards the outward, it is his will that she should neglect no part of her duty in the station in which he has placed her, a direction which comprehends infinitely more than the most minute detail could do, and while she must follow the attraction of the Holy Spirit in all liberty as to the inward life, he would have her also conform to the external usages of religion and be obedient to those in authority as to the exterior, and this he expresses by going forth in the footsteps of the flock, that is to say, in the ordinary, common way, externally, and by feeding the kids, that is, the senses, by the shepherd's tents.
Verse 8 I have compared thee, O my love, to my company of horsemen in Pharaoh's chariots. The bridegroom, knowing perfectly well that all the commendations which he lavishes on his beloved, far from rendering her vain, only further her annihilation, praises her in magnificent strains that her love may be fed. I have compared thee, he says, to my company of horsemen. That is, I desire of thee a course so swift and sure in me that I can only liken thy single soul to a whole company running toward me with extreme rapidity. I have compared thee to my angels, and I will afford thee the same bliss that they enjoy, always to behold my face. Still, for the better concealment of such great things while thou art upon the earth, I have made thee externally like to the chariots of Pharaoh. Those who behold thee running so swiftly, and as it were disorderly, will believe that thou art in search of the pleasures, the vanities, and the multiplicities of Egypt, or that thou art busy in self-seeking, in such eager haste, but thou art running toward me, and thy race shall end in me alone, and nothing shall prevent thy safe arrival, because of the strength and fidelity with which I have supplied thee. Verse 9 Thy cheeks are comely as a turtle dove's, thy neck as jewels. The cheeks signify the interior and exterior. They are comely as a turtle dove's. The dove is said to have this peculiarity, that when one of a pair dies, the other ever after remains single, without seeking another mate. So the soul, separated from its God, can take no pleasure in any creature, either within or without. Within, it is reduced to a solitude so much the more complete, in that, not finding the bridegroom, it cannot be occupied with anything else. Without, everything is dead, so far as it is concerned, and it is this very separation of the soul from every creature and from everything that is not God that constitutes its beauty in the eyes of the well-beloved. Her neck represents pure love, which is the greatest stay left her. But though she appears in a state of the greatest nakedness, she is still enriched by the practice of numberless virtues, which, like jewels of great price, serve as an ornament. But without this adornment, love alone would render her perfectly beautiful, just as the neck of the bride though stripped of jewels, is not deprived of beauty. Verse 10 We will make thee chains of gold inlaid with silver. Although thou art already beautiful in thy nakedness, the evidence of a pure heart and unfeigned charity, we will still add something farther to set off thy beauty by giving thee precious ornaments. These shall be chains, in token of thy perfect submission to every will of the King of glory. But they shall be of gold, to signify that, acting only from an exceedingly purified love, thou hast but a single and pure regard to the good pleasure and glory of God in everything thou doest or sufferest for Him. Nevertheless, they shall be inlaid with silver, because, however simple and pure charity may be in itself, it must appear and be made manifest externally in the practice of good works and the most excellent virtues. It is to be noted that the Divine Master takes special care in many passages to instruct his beloved pupil as to the supreme purity he requires in the love of the spouse and in her faithfulness to neglect nothing in the service of the well-beloved or the help of the neighbor. Verse 11 while the king was reclining upon his couch, my spikenard sent forth the smell thereof. The spouse is not yet so unclothed, but that she receives from time to time visits from her well-beloved. But why do I call it a visit? It is rather a manifestation of himself, an experience of his deep and central presence. 
the Holy Bridegroom is ever in the center of the soul that is faithful to Him, but He often dwells there in such a hidden manner that the spouse is almost always ignorant of her happiness except at certain times when He is pleased to reveal Himself to the loving soul, which then perceives Him deeply and intimately present. Such is His conduct toward this the pierce of His followers, as is testified by her words, When my King, He who reigns over and guides me as a sovereign, was reclining upon His couch, which is the ground and center of my soul, where He takes His rest. My spikenard, that is, my faithfulness, sent forth the smell thereof so sweetly and pleasantly that He was obliged to discover Himself to me. Then I recognized that He was reposing within me as on His royal couch, which before I was ignorant of, for although He was there, yet I knew it not. Verse 12 A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall abide between my breasts. When the bride, or rather the lover, for she is not yet a bride, has found her bridegroom, she is so transported with joy that she is eager to be instantly united to him. But the union of perpetual enjoyment is not yet arrived. He is mine, she says. I cannot doubt that he gives himself to me this moment, since I feel it, but he is to me, as it were, a bundle of myrrh. He is not yet a bridegroom whom I may embrace in the nuptial bed, but a bundle of crosses, pains, and mortifications, a bloody husband and crucified lover who desires to test my faithfulness by making me partaker of a good share of his sufferings. For this is the part of the soul at this period. As an evidence, however, of the progress of this already heroic soul, note that she does not say, My well-beloved will give me the bundle of the cross, but that he himself should be that bundle. For all my crosses shall be those of my well-beloved. This bundle shall be betwixt my breasts as an evidence that he will be a bridegroom of bitterness as well without as within. External crosses are a small matter if unaccompanied by those which are internal, and the inward are rendered much more painful by the simultaneous presence of the outward. But though the soul perceives nothing but the cross on every side, it is nevertheless her well-beloved in the shape of the cross, and he never is more present to her than in those seasons of bitterness, during which he dwells in the midst of her heart. Verse 13 My beloved is unto me as a cluster of cypress in the vineyards of Ingadi. My beloved, continues the lover, is unto me as a cluster of cypress. She only partially expresses herself. It is as though she said, He is only near to me, for I have not the blessedness of that intimate union by which he would dwell wholly in me, and I in him. He is nevertheless near to me, but as a cluster of cypress, a shrub producing a very fragrant balm, since it is he only who gives odor and value to everything that is done by those who love him. This cluster grows in the vineyards of Ingadi, which are very beautiful, and the grapes of which are excellent. She compares her well-beloved to the pleasant fragrance and excellent virtue of balsam, to the delights and strength of wine, to express by these images that he, who has learned from the interior enjoyments of God to put his pleasure in him, can no longer find delights in anything else, and that we no sooner seek any other source of satisfaction than we lose that which is divine. Verse 14 Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. The well-beloved, beholding the readiness of the spouse to be crucified and instructed by him, is charmed with the lustre of the beauty he has bestowed upon her. He caresses and praises her, calling her his fair one, 
and his well-beloved. Behold, thou art fair, my love, he says. Behold, thou art fair. Sweet words. He refers to a double beauty, one external and the other internal. But he desires that she should perceive it as though he would say, Behold, thou art fair already in the depths, though thou art not yet perfected. Know too, that in a little while thou shalt be perfectly beautiful without, when I shall have finished thee and drawn thee out of thy weaknesses. These praises are accompanied by the promise of a more exquisite beauty, in the hope of which the soul will take courage, which its humility is cherished by reflecting on its imperfections. But why does he say that in a little while she shall be endued with a double beauty? It is because she has already dove's eyes. That is, she is simple within, not turning aside from the view of her God, and without, in all her words and actions, which are destitute of guile. This dove-like simplicity is the surest mark of the advancements of a soul. For no longer making use of indirect means or artifices, she is led by the Spirit of God. The spouse understood from the beginning the necessity of simplicity and the perfect nature of uprightness when she said, The upright love thee, verse 3, which she places the perfection of love in its simplicity and uprightness. Verse 15 Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, and comely. Our bed is adorned with flowers. The loving soul, seeing that her bridegroom has praised her for her double beauty and unwilling to appropriate anything to herself, says in return, Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, and comely. She returns him all the praise she had received from him and adds more on her own part. Nothing belonging to us, no praise, no glory, and no pleasure. Everything must be referred to Him who is the author and center of every good. The loving soul teaches us this important point of practice throughout, everywhere giving glory to the Lord for everything He has bestowed upon her. If I am beautiful, she says to Him, it is with thine own beauty. It is thou who art beautiful in me with this double beauty which thou praisest in me. Our bed, she adds, that inner retreat in which thou dwellest in me, and which I call ours, that thou mayest thereby be induced to come and give me there the nuptial kiss which I first asked of thee, and which is my final end. Our bed is ready, and adorned with the flowers of a thousand virtues. Verse 16 the beams of our houses are of cedar, and our carved ceilings are of cypress. The bridegroom, hidden in the ground and center of the soul, as has been said, takes pleasure in sending from the sanctuary in which he dwells certain effusions of his sensible graces which produce in the exterior of the spouse an abundance of different virtues which are like flowers. Finding herself adorned with these, she is so surprised and charmed, or perhaps has so little experience, that she believes her inward edifice is nearly completed. The roof is on, she says. The beams, which are the practice of exterior virtues, are laid of cedar. Methinks I perceive their agreeable odor, and that I can practice them with as much strength as ease. The regulation of the senses appears to me to be perfectly accomplished as the setting in order of the carved and beautiful ceiling of Cyprus. But, O oh spouse, this only appears so to thee because thy bed is adorned with flowers, and because the sweet, grateful, and pleasant state which thou experienced within makes thee believe that thou hast gained everything without. But remember, thy ceilings are of Cyprus which is a tree of death, and all this beauty and adornment 
are but the preparation for a sacrifice. You have just heard a production of God Sounds Incorporated. To support our ministry, you may purchase this audiobook at any of the following locations. Godsounds.com, audible.com, or at the iTunes store. You may also support us at patreon.com slash godsounds to receive complimentary downloads.